I'll make a start to welcome you all here. Good to see you. A little bit shorter this morning, but uh, no, good to see all of you here. And David, as you know, is up, he's got us Sunday off. So, welcome to you all on the second Sunday in Advent. And a special welcome if we have got any visitors with us this morning. And to Ed, Edwin Cottingham leading our service this morning. I'm very grateful to him. And so David and Liz are away, that's his special Sunday off. So do please stay for refreshments after the service. Six o'clock tonight, the group meet to pray for Israel. And at half past six, we have an evening communion service. And this will be led by Steve Lyers. We're very grateful to him. Right, this coming week on Monday, tomorrow, the Mission and Prayer Fellowship, as usual, on the first Monday of the month. Um, and that's at 2.30. Tuesday, 2.30, I think I'm right, the East Preston Home Group will be meeting. Yes, thumbs up. And Wednesday, we shall have the prayer meeting in church for any of you who'd like to attend. It's usually a full group over there in the corner, so do come along. And then something else on Wednesday, I've told you a couple of times, I think, that the Cub Scouts have got their carol service. So we shall have a nice full church here on uh, Wednesday evening at 6.30. If you can come, it's always good for all the council and the parents to see uh, others from the church. You won't be disappointed, though it, they do a lovely nativity uh, time. Uh, Thursday, as usual, 10 o'clock, babies and toddlers group, I'm sure, a meeting. And then next Saturday, the next DVD at 10 o'clock, the title of the DVD is Sexuality, Who Decides? Ken Ham compares our views with God's design rooted in Genesis. So that will be a special one to come, and that's just under the hour, that one. Then next Sunday, our services will be led by David again, and the morning service, it's after the morning service, we will be having a Christmas lunch. Please do add your name to the list if you haven't already. There's room, still a few spaces available. And um, I think most of us have been asking, if you haven't paid anything, Alan will be here next week and then we should get the money back to him. Um, just to mention Christmas cards, the poster notice board is ready for any cards you'd like to give for the whole church. So do put them up there. And then I'm going to finish with the saying, Thank you, first of all, to Steve and Sylvia for putting up the lovely tree yesterday, and they want to thank people who did contribute to buying it. So it's both ways, but thank you for putting it up. And we've got the candles in the window and apologise. They were both set to light yesterday, and one lot hasn't, or isn't working today, but it will be by next week. Well, thank you very much. Over to you now. Jeremiah 29, 11, we read, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So we promise that, isn't it? God has plans, and this morning we're going to look at God's plan in particular. And we'll hopefully cover 6,000 years in about half an hour. <laughs> but let's stand up and sing together. 708, to God be the glory. And after we've sung this, um, Stuart and uh, Edward are going to come out and light the candles for us. So uh, if you'd like to follow out after him. So 708, to God be the glory. Great things he has done. So lovely the world that he gave us his son.
Cardinal of Peace. Peace. Who are the peace by sending? Peace, so eternal and unending. Peace, that passes all understanding. Peace, so perfect and undemanding. Peace, lovely peace floods into our soul. Peace of healing makes us whole. Peace from God, peace from heaven. Peace, Jesus whispers deep within. Thank you for that. Peace. In a troubled world, it's rather a word, isn't it? Peace. The very word seems to bring a calmness, and we can know that all the troubles and struggles that seem to be going on around, and all we hear on the news is anything but peace. But peace is the one thing God can give us in even the most troubled times. I'm going to ask Steve now to come out and lead us in in prayer. Thank you, Steve. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in prayer this morning, recognising your glory and power and majesty. We lift up the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, who said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. We thank you that we can meet here today freely, and so many of our brothers and sisters in Christ risk their lives to meet together in your name. We pray that you will protect them all today. Thank you, Lord, for the churches here in Angry, especially remembering our pastor and his wife today. Please bless them both and their family and equip him to pastor, lead and teach us in the power of your Holy Spirit. <coughs> we pray Lord for our country and for our leaders. We ur urgently need a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit in your church to equip us to take the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ and no other to the lost in our land. We especially remember our friends and family members that don't know you, Father, and pray that you bring them under the sound of the gospel through salvation in Jesus. In a few moments quiet now, let's just bring all of those known to us within this church that especially need your help and blessing today. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Israel, and the sharing of the gospel there, and for the missionaries that we all support in representing you around the world today. Let's close together by saying the Lord's Prayer. <coughs> Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, heaven. to restore everything to perfect it. And that plan is still unfolding today. We're part <coughs> of it. And we're going to look back over this plan in the next few minutes and the time scale and how the plan is unfolding. 
And notice too, as we look at different prophecies, how accurately they have been fulfilled. We have all sorts of people that claim to make uh, predictions of the future, but they're always a bit vague. <coughs> But with the prophecies God gives, is given to his people, they are fulfilled to the letter. <coughs> we pick up on that as we go through. And I don't know if you've ever thought about all those names in the Bible that come, you know, someone begat someone and the rest of it. What was the point of them? But that gives us a time scale. <coughs> and someone has calculated it was about 2,000 years <coughs> between Adam and Abraham. Now, that gives us, well, how accurate that is, it doesn't really matter, but it gives us a time frame that we would be working to. But just before Margaret comes and gives us a reading from Genesis, let's sing together 825, Faithful One, So Unchanging.
is from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 7. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed, as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him, and Abraham was seventy and five years old, when he departed out of Haran. And Abraham took Sarah his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abraham passed through the land into the place of Sishon, unto the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there buildeth he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. And this is the word of the Lord. Thank you. It's awful when you get old, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Albert. Let's take a hymn book again and sing All the Way My Saviour Leads Me. You know, Abram went out not knowing where he was going. Most of us like to know where we're going, we set off on the journey. But Abram went off just trusting God. And this hymn was actually that all the way to the same Saviour leads him. What am I to ask this stuff? Can I doubt his tender mercies? Let's <laughs> that. Oh 
In this promise to Abraham, in Genesis 12, God said, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That was some promise, wasn't it? But God, in it, God reveals his unfolding, the unfolding of his plan to provide salvation and restoration to his creation. <laughs> This promise prophesies the coming of Jesus Christ, which will be celebrated in three weeks' time. But Abram had no offspring. He had no children at that time. He was 75 years old, and his wife was 65 years old. And it was highly unlikely that he ever would have any offspring in that way, wouldn't it? And then finally, 25 years later, when Abram's 100 years old and Sarah's 90, Isaac is born. That itself is a miracle. We know they try to engineer themselves rather unfortunately. But God always fulfills his word. No matter how long it takes, the promises of God are sure, he always fulfills his word. Move on another 500 years, and Abram's descendants have become so numerous in the land of Egypt that Pharaoh indulged in a bit of ethnic cleansing. He ordered that all Hebrew boys that were born were to be thrown into the river. One mother had a boy, and she hit her son as long as he could, but you know you can't call baby, babies for long, they make their presence firm. And so eventually, she created a basket and float, and put her son in it, and put him in the river. She obeyed the order of the pharaoh. He didn't say you couldn't float in there, but he said you put him in the river. And that's where pharaoh's daughter him, took pity on him, and took her back, took him as her son. And she called him Moses. And the word name Moses means to pull out or draw out. And that, in a way, was prophetic, because that was God's plan for Moses to eventually draw out all the Abraham's descendants of Hebrews from slavery. And God was still working out his plan to create a nation and a city where Jesus will eventually come to reign. Moses spent 40 years in the palace learning leadership skills and then he spent another 40 years in the wilderness learning bushcraft or survival skills if you like. Then at 80 years old it was finally ready for God to use, to fulfil God's plan and purposes. And yeah, there's a lesson we can take from that. Abel was 75 when God called him out. Moses was 80. So if you've got to old age, and you're somewhere around about the 70s and 80s, or maybe even 90s, don't think you can sit back and say, well, I've done my bit. <laughs> God might be just, you might be just about ready for God to use for the purpose he has for your life. That's an encouragement to us, or should we, shouldn't it? We can't sit back. God has a plan for the life of every man. And then he will work that plan out if we are prepared to yield to him. Another few hundred years go by, about 700 or thereabouts. And the prophet Isaiah appears to be seen. And God calls him to speak out, prophesy. And God reveals a bit more of his plan through Isaiah. And we read in Isaiah 7:14, the virgin will be with child, and will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. And again in chapter 9, verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of the shadow of death, 
a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. We move on another 700 years. So we're now what, in 2,000 years after eight, Thomas came to Abraham. And we read of an angel suddenly appearing to a young girl who was engaged to be married. Luke 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent his angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly, highly favoured. The Lord is with you. <laughs> Mary was greatly troubled at these words and wondered what kind of a greeting this might be. <laughs> well, we all feel like that. <laughs> to think about it. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You are found favoured with God. You'll be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. <coughs> so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who has said to be barren is in her sixth month. And nothing is impossible with God. Truly, nothing is impossible with God. Now the name of Jesus means salvation. And just as Moses meant salvation from slavery, he drew the people out. So Jesus means salvation from slavery to sin. He pulls out all who trusted him from death to life. And there have been many prophecies about the coming Messiah over the 2,000 years since God's promise to Abraham. People believed it. They were waiting, expecting him to appear. But when Jesus came, he didn't come in the way they expected. All the way they imagined. <clears throat> so they didn't believe him or accept him. Instead, in spite of all the miracles and signs he gave them, they still didn't believe, but they crucified him instead. But that was God's plan to provide salvation for man, to lead eventually to restoration of God's creation, the destruction of Satan, and to give eternal life to all those who believe in Jesus for their salvation. We have those lovely verses in John 3.16, which tell us that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever excludes no one whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. But you heard on the news.
used this week, that census, which this country, once known as a Christian country, more than 50% of the people have had no religion, they say. Well, so what? No religion. This isn't a religion we've got to have to get a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the key, a relationship with Jesus. And that's a challenge for each of us. Do we have a relationship with Jesus Christ? One day the, the disciples were looking at the building around and they said how wonderful the temple was. And Jesus said, not going to happen. One day, not one stone will remain on another. In AD 70, Jerusalem was ransacked by the Romans. Everything with the temple was destroyed. And successive wars led to the Jews being scattered around the world. They were driven from the promised land. And it was God's judgment on that nation. For the rejection of him. And they actually have suffered for that for those 2,000 years since. From 1517 to 1917, that's 400 years, the land became part of the Ottoman Empire, and the main religion then was Islam. Then in 1917, it came under British rule, and then late thirties, Hitler turned up on the scene with his final solution to rid the world of all Jews. But he set about complete annihilation. But God had other plans. You see, all this has been decided, decided. It's Satan's attempt to destroy that nation, destroy that land, destroy that city, because that is where Jesus is coming back to. God had other plans. And in 1948, there was the Declaration of Independence, the, and the land of Israel was re-established. But nearly 600 years before Christ, as over two and a half thousand years ago, Ezekiel prophesied, chapter 37, 21, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. It's what God says, not what man says, it's what God says. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they've gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back to their own land. I'll make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. Remember, Israel had been divided when the tribes split apart. And God said he'd bring them back. And with that declaration of independence on the 14th of May 1948, God's word has been fulfilled. Well, he said, we've been fulfilling it ever since, as Ezekiel had said. And Isaiah prophesied about 100 years before Ezekiel about aircraft. I don't know if you realise that. This is what it says in Isaiah 60, verse 8. Who are these that fly along like clouds, like doves to their nests? Sure, the islands look to me. In the lead are the tips of Tarshish, bringing your sons from afar with their silver and gold to the honour of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, who has endowed you with splendour. How have the Jews been returning to the land of Israel? By air and by sea. It is the literal fulfilment of God's word. And when was the first passenger flight? <coughs> well, the first passenger <coughs> flight was on the 1st of January 1914, just over 100 years ago. And yet Isaiah prophesied about this two and a half thousand years, just over two, two and a half thousand years ago. That is how accurate God's word is. That's how we can be sure that what he says in his word is going to happen. God is still working his purpose out. His word is sure and his plans will be fulfilled. And Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. 
In my father's house are many rooms. I'll put the other verse and it says mansions. Yeah. Still. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to put beds in it. So it can't be a bit better than that. <laughs> if it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Someone said, it's taken over 2,000 years. It must be some place he's prepared. <laughs> In Luke 12, 42, it said, you must be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Now, I've read that verse many, many times, but it's only as I was preparing this morning that I noticed those three words, all the time. Are you ready all the time for Jesus to return? And Jesus said in Matthew 24, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, even he doesn't know, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. And that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand in it. One will be taken. The other left. And again in Luke 17, Jesus says, I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. We don't know when Jesus will return. But we do know he will. Because it's part of his plan. And God says so. We do know he's coming back to Jerusalem. And since 1967, the Yom Kippur War, Jerusalem has been in the hands of the Israelites. We read in Zechariah 14, The day of the Lord is coming. I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured, the houses ransacked, and the women raped. Half the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations, as he fights in the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, <coughs> east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will split in two from east to west, forming a great valley. Half the mountain moving north, and half the mountain moving south. You will flee by my mountain valley, for it extends to Azar. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Azar, king of Judah. Then the Lord will come, my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. Now did you know there is a fault line that runs through Jerusalem? It's there, we know it there, and if we've seen earthquakes recently, recent years, and you know when there's an earthquake, the plates of the earth part, or they push in together, mountains go up, mountains come down. And that is what is described, we know now as a fault line, and that is where the valley will be formed. And this is why God has brought the Jews back to Israel. The nation has been re-established. This is why Hitler and others have been unsuccessful in trying to annihilate the Jews. There has to be a Jerusalem for Jesus to come back to and reign from. And we look at these prophecies 
uh, that have been, and are now, even now, being fulfilled, and have been fulfilled in our day. We look at the timeline, according to those who calculate it. We can calculate, but we know what the generations are. And it's roughly 2,000 years from Adam to Abraham. Another 2,000 years for Abram to Jesus Christ. Okay. Another 2,000 years to date. Now, this is pure speculation on my part, but I see a correlation in that between Genesis 1, when God created the earth. We read that he created in six days. Peter, 2 Peter 3 8 tells us that a thousand years is a day. So when you put the two together, we've gone six thousand years, we've gone six days. We know from scripture that Jesus is going to come back and reign for a thousand years. And God rested on the seventh day. That will be the seventh day. And the earth will be at rest for a thousand years under the reign of Jesus. He's going to bring back all his holy ones with him. Who are the holy ones? I looked up in one of the document, one of the um, things you go back and it said the angels. Now I don't think that's right. I think there's going to be something else before there. Before that time happens, there's going to be Jesus coming back. What we call the rapture. We won't find out where the scripture or anything, but we call that when we're caught up. And Paul writes about it in 1 Thessalonians 4. According to the world's own word, the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left to the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command. With the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. And he continues in the next chapter. Now, brothers, about time and date, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as lay your hands on the present world. And they will not escape. And we read a bit further in verse 9 of 2 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through Jesus Christ. Yes, God is a God of justice and judgment, but he didn't appoint us to suffer wrath and judgment. He appointed us to receive salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. He died so that whether we were awake or asleep, we may live together with him, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. For several years I went to a church that believed and taught <coughs> that we, Christians, would go through the great tribulation that the Bible talks about. Before the rapture, before Christ comes back, we would go through this great tribulation when we meet the Lord in the air. And whilst I can see where they were coming from and the argument and the scriptures they were referring to to support that argument, I personally do not agree with it. For one thing, it eclipses the suddenness of Christ's return. We're not appointed to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation. But the main reason, I think, is found in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 6 to 7, which is talking about the man of sin, the evil one, that's going to be revealed and rule in this earth. And Paul writes there, and now you know what is holding him back. So he may be revealed at the proper time. 
For the secret power of lawlessness, lawlessness is already at work. And we know that, we know the right world around us, how wickedness is at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Well, who is the one holding back wickedness at the moment? It's the Holy Spirit. God, Jesus said, if I go away, I'll send another comforter. The Holy Spirit is not going to be taken out of the earth all the while there are believers on this earth. But when Jesus returns and calls all, take, catches up all who, are, who belong to him in the air to meet him in the air, then the Holy Spirit can leave and then wickedness will break out in a way never before imagined. The lawless one will be revealed. And then evil really were about. Have you ever thought, stopped to think about what will happen when all the believers are suddenly caught up to meet the Lord in the air? Sometimes when I'm driving down the motorway at 70 miles an hour, if it's permitted to do so, I put the car onto cruise control. And the thing drives itself. I'm just having to sit there and steer. If I'm suddenly caught up to meet the Lord in the air when I'm driving at 70 miles down the motorway, where is the car going to go? What's going to happen? What about train drivers? Pilots? People in key positions? In government and all the rest of it? There are many, many Christians in all the place. Suddenly they're gone. Imagine what the chaos will be in this earth for those who are left behind. And Jesus said, you must be ready all the time. Are you? Jesus said, one will be taken and the other left. If Jesus comes today, which one will you be? Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 8.20 The harvest is past, the summer has ended, and we are not saved. Too late. We've missed the opportunity. There's an Irish lad, um, I don't think they, Owen Mack, and he sings a song, If Jesus Comes Tomorrow, just think about these words. If Jesus comes tomorrow to spend some time with you, would you answer all his questions or lie to hide the truth? Would you welcome him with open arms or even let him in? If Jesus comes tomorrow, what then? If Jesus calls your number, could you leave today? Are you ready to lay down your worldly goods and walk away? Would it take a month of Sundays just to tell him of your sin? If Jesus comes tomorrow, what then? If the sky turns black as midnight in the middle of the day, and somehow you knew that Jesus would soon be on his way. Would you have to beg forgiveness? Or could you reach out and take his hand? If Jesus comes tomorrow, what then? <coughs> Tell him thought, isn't it? Are you ready to meet your Lord and Son? Jesus said, be ready all the time. Are you? I have a very cat friendly clock up there, I notice. <laughs> it's not budged. It's only past nine from the time I started. Normally time flies, not this morning it seems. <laughs> Let's take a hint of it.
262. I'm waiting for the dawn of that bright and blessed day when the dark night of sorrow shall have vanished far away. When forever with the Saviour, far beyond this vale of tears, I shall swell the sun of worship from the everlasting years. That's an encouraging thought, isn't it? Jesus is coming back. And I think we can see that the time is short. How soon, we don't know. But we have to see that what's happening in the world, it must be very soon. Best hands. <laughs> Jesus be with God's people. And all the people said,